So, hello, my name is Adi and I'm happy to be here today with you for a new self-publishing mastery talk. And today it is, of course, another special one because we have with us uh, K.G. Waters, a best-selling author, a renowned podcaster, an award-winning blogger, a consultant. Oh, and she wears so many hats away. Welcome, K.G. Waters. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Happy, happy to happy to have here with us. Uh, you already uh, wrote a guest blog post for Self Publishing Mastery uh, about writing a book series, and we are going to talk about this today. But first of all, I want to know how is your new book doing? The My one new book that I just happen to have here, Shattering Time, is doing really well. I'm extremely excited to get this out. Of, you know, after a year or more of writing it and editing it and all those things. It's just such a relief to get it out there. And uh, when I put it up for pre-sale, it made it to number 29 that next day on Amazon. So I was so excited and it's doing really well. I'm trying to get it to number one and that seems to be, there's, you know, it's just hard to do that. So I'm working hard on that right now. And uh, it's the post public, you know, you, the month or two after you first put a book out, it's, I thought it was busy getting ready to publish but now it's uh, I'm in that mode of just trying to get everything done but it's been it's done really well and um, last week I put up my short story for uh, for free because in the back of my short story it's called blow it has an excerpt from this new book so I thought and then links and everything so I thought my goal was pretty much just to push people to that within I put it up at noon on Monday, by, uh, I mean, a morning on Monday, and by noon it was number one, and it has been number one on the USA Amazon in that cat in two or three categories since it, since then. So I'm like, oh, I didn't even expect that to happen. But yeah, that's amazing. Um, so yeah. if things are going really well, it's just better than expected. <laughs> oh, happy for you. But it's been, it's, things were very well, very well for you in the past too, because the first book in the series was also was a bestseller, right? So Yes. Yes, yeah, that went to, to number one as well, and you know, it's just you don't, you never know what to expect, especially when you're indie. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it, I've talked to people that are in every area of that spectrum, from never seen before or after to bestseller. So uh, it's it's exciting. It's an exciting market right now. There's so much going on and so many new things that are coming down the pike. So why did you choose to take the self-publishing route? Okay, that's a very good question. When I first started writing, it was about 10 years ago, and I was terrified. I'm like, I don't know how to do the publishing thing. And 10 years ago, think about that. It was totally yeah. different. Yeah. So I just didn't. I kept writing. I thought, well, when I get to that point, I will worry about it. And I'm glad I did that because any worry would have been pointless because things have changed so much. So when I first was getting close to having a book ready, I got online and started talking to some authors and I met one named Kirkus McGowan and he was pretty big in the indie world back then and gave me some really great advice. And part of it was an impatience because I also sat down with a publisher and I said, Hey, you know, what's the process? And um, his advice was, you know, it takes a year to two years for them to get back to you. And I'm like, I finished this book. It took me 10 years. I really didn't want to wait two more years. He says the other option is to put it up, you know, on Amazon and then you can get a publisher after that if you want or just see how that goes. So I thought, well, what do I have to lose? <laughs> so I went that route and I'm really happy I did. I have friends um, who've gone both ways and friends that started indie and got picked up and vice versa. People that were published with a, a mainstream publisher and then went indie so there's it's been really interesting to see everyone's journey and everyone's is completely different so I mean I would say that if a, a big publisher came to me I would definitely you know talk to them and see but my biggest problem is you know all the promotions and trying yeah. to get it out to a bigger yeah. market so I would yeah. look at that but I'm definitely not interested in the little tiny publishers that you know charge you $1,800 to publish yeah, you know, I, yeah. I, I, I feel the same uh, getting back to your wonderful books uh, I'd like to know, how did you choose the category? So when you wrote a book, because I know that's a little bit of a struggle for some authors. I was talking to an author today and he was saying, oh, I don't, I'm not sure my book is in the right category. So what's the best way to do it? Well, you know, when I first did, when I put my first book up, it was 2000, the end of 2015. And 
I don't know. I don't know what I was doing. The nice thing about it is that you can change it, right? So yeah. what you can do also is um, I did a little bit of research. I looked into, you know, what my books were. And you also want to look at uh, how many books are in each of the categories. You want to try to find one category that doesn't have a huge amount of books in it because it's easier to get up to number one. Your ranking will be better in that category. So there's a little nuance to it. Of course, it has to fit what the book is about because you don't want to disappoint people who are looking for something yeah. in that category. Um, but, you know, the, the cool thing is that you can change that. So you can do a little study, have a month your book at, you know, one category, maybe just switch another one, switch one of them to just see how your sales are in that next category. Mm -hmm. Like for blow, I have blow up for free just this week. Mm -hmm. And, um, it, and it went to number one right away. One of the categories that I have, I went to number one in two categories. The third category, I got to number two, and is at number two like all week now? It's at number four. But I'm looking at that category, and I don't know how it got put in there. I think Amazon adds that third category, and it's just like general literature and fiction. I'm like, well, why am I in that category? So if I go to do it free again, I'm going to try to switch that category, something a little bit more specific mm -hmm. to what I'm doing, because there's so many books in that category, mm -hmm. and people may not find mine appealing in that giant category, or just maybe not find it. So well, the other thing I got to say about categories, mm -hmm. as I was looking for the categories for the new book I just put up, slightly different than my other one because it does have that Native American element. But as I was looking for it, there's an article that I searched that talks about, you know, which categories have the least number of books in it. So as I'm looking through there, I see science, which is oh. not what I write. But my son, who's going to be a senior this year, I was like, you know, what you could do to help you get into college is write a book. And here's a category that doesn't have a lot of books in it. Mm -hmm. He's like, I could do that. I'm like, you might get to number one. You may not, but you could be ranked somewhere. And then you have a book. This is the one thing that sets you apart from your peers. Mm -hmm. How many of those kids have a published book, right? And possibly number one. So, you know, there's, there's a, a nuance to that too. Like maybe when you're about to write a book, go see what the categories look like, which ones don't have a lot of representation and, and, and use it to your advantage. Mm -hmm. You know, of course you have to write fiction that people want to read. I mean, I don't know how many people want to read science but that's what my son does he's really he's number one in the state for physics and oh, you know that's kind of wow, yeah, that's great. he's uh yeah i didn't mean to turn this into mom bragging about it <laughs> no it's fine it's another way to use the the categories to your advantage so yeah, yeah yeah definitely so you already so you have a series you have two books uh should the categories uh, should be the same for both books I think. Well, I have an overlap. The time travel, mm -hmm. romantic suspense is the overlap. Both books are in that category. The stealing time, which I happen to have here, is not Native American. So I don't have it set up that way. What, what I do, you know, I, I can't remember the categories I have, but there's one that overlaps. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I have my short story is um, crime, mystery, suspense, and thriller. So it's it's different. I mean, you kind of have to match the book to what the what's in the content of it. But I like the fact that my two um, main you know main in the series have the overlapping the time travel romantic suspense. So um, I think there's a way to you know carries the series through. People that like that category will keep seeing it in that same category. Are you a plotter or a pencil? <laughs> Ha! I always ask them on the podcast too. I love this question because so many times we find that people change, right? So when I first started, I didn't know what I was doing. I just wrote. And so I was definitely a pantser. And I think in life in general, I'm a pantser for mm -hmm. most things. Um, but after I finished that book, what I did is I wrote a giant book, which is now four books when I first started. And I was like, you know, it really needs to be cut up. So I really had the whole thing, which is nice mm -hmm. for weaving all the pieces together. Um, in the second book, I realized that I was so much faster mm -hmm. and had a much tighter, uh, more suspenseful um, feeling in my first draft if I knew what each chapter was. Now what happens, and you probably have this too, is that as you're writing, your characters come in and they're like, nah, I'm not going to do that. I'm mm -hmm. going to go here and do this mm -hmm. and we're going to go off on this tangent. And yeah. so you have to kind of repair it as you go, mm -hmm. which I think is really exciting. But to have the structure, so I'm, I'm, I like the word Suzanne and I came off as plumper. I'm kind of a mixture. Okay. <laughs> but I would definitely say that I'm merging away from pantser into more of a plotter. And so my third book, 
I've already got a lot, you know, I've got the whole thing plotted out. So now I just have to go in and write the chapters and then we'll see what my characters do. I mean, I'm sure they'll sabotage me, but that's okay. I like that too. I like that element of surprise. And, you know, I think for me, the way my books are is I have a lot of layers woven in there. And the fact that it took me 10 years to write all that, I had a lot of time to put in. Oh, yeah. I write the first draft, and then I go back in and I'm like, oh, let's do this twisty thing. And then that will lead to the first book and to the third book and then the fourth book. Stuff that the reader doesn't know until they get there. And then they're like, oh my gosh, yeah. how did she do that? You know, so um, I would definitely say that like the very last draft I do, my intuition comes in and it mm -hmm. makes all these new connections that I hadn't seen the first mm -hmm. couple of times. So um, it's a lot of fun. I love it yeah definitely it is and it sounds like fun so yeah i'm i'm working on a on a book series as well i didn't plan it as a book series in the first place but then i changed my mind and i said yeah it could be like set one book set in california another book book set in dublin and uh the third book set in thailand so that's yeah. great yeah, yeah and that's one of the things that i learned too is when i was figuring out how to break up i had this one long book settings is really important to have a distinct setting for each book and that gives you newness and freshness while keeping the same character so you're bringing some of the things that people are familiar with and love but you're giving them fresh you know situations and, and new places to look at and that kind of thing so that's exciting what's the name of your series do you have a name yet oh, um well actually the working title is uh a, my life on tinder <laughs> oh i like that yeah, uh, I wouldn't say it's romance. I'd say it's more like a love story, um, women's fiction. But I'll see how it will. How it yeah, will. yeah, yeah. We'll see what your characters do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But so far, you're uh, like the expert here in writing series. So you already have two best-selling books under your belt. And uh, from your experience, what would be like the best practices in writing a book series? And actually managing to getting the book out, getting getting it done and putting it up on Amazon. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's a really good question. There's two separate elements. One of them is how to write a compelling series. And I just did a blog post for you. Thank you so much, yeah. for that, by the way. Right you can go look at it on her site that you know just has like five tips. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I did, and this is when I first started writing, I didn't know what the heck I was doing, but I got um the Marshall Plan by Evan Marshall. It's just how to write fiction. Mm -hmm. And so that, to me, that was a really good resource. And one of the things it did is the very beginning is you do a bio on each character. And I even found pictures of each person. Um, I went to like a Sears catalog or something where they had the same model in several different poses and different angles and different clothes. So I cut all those out and then I created like, here's their background. Where's their family from? Where's their dad from? What are the jobs of the parents? Where did they grow up? What was their biggest weakness? What is their biggest strength? And it's annoying because like, I'm a person that just wants to jump in and do it. But I am so glad I did that because now as I've gone through the series, the characters are consistent. I've built on their character, but I didn't have to make new things up about where they came from. So as I'm writing, I already have that established and I don't switch it there. It's pretty firm. Now that I've written the second book, these people are so, my, their voices are so much in my head. I can just sit down and write somebody. So mm -hmm. I don't really have to go back to that very often. But to me, it was just a really good way of getting to know the characters. And what you don't want to do is throw all that in the book. Because people don't want all that detail. What you do is you weave it into how they react, what they say, maybe one little line of, you know, he made his money in the dot-com business and things like that where you you know it's there, the reader gets the nuance, but they don't need to have like, here's the daily dump of, you know, 20 pages of research I did to set up the character. Nobody wants all that, especially at the beginning of the book. So it gives you a way to, you know, just know who they are. So if you're starting a series and the characters are, coming through. Now I've added new characters to, you know, the second book, the third book will have a few new characters as well. Um, so you have to kind of do that again for the new people. Um, but it's, it's well worth it. Cause now I feel like I know them so well. I mean, I made them up. I should, but by the time you get to the point where you're in book two, book three, that's what people really like about the series is because they're familiar with them. They don't have to learn a new character and know their motivations. And, and you want to make sure they're consistent throughout the different books. The second thing that I found really helpful, and this is what I got from Suzanne Kalman, my podcast partner, is that, okay, so when I decide 
I'm close enough to getting to, you know, maybe I, I know I have about, you know, a year to go before I publish a book or less. Okay. I come out with, I have this huge calendar of each month. And so I write down what my goals are and they can shift, but it's like a write on wipe off. So if I need to like, you know, oh, didn't miss that. It didn't make that deadline. I'll do another one. But then you plot it out. And so you have, okay, on March 1st, I'm going to finish my first draft. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do I get to that March 1st deadline? I need to do, and that's say I need 80,000 words. And you break it down. And so each week I need to do 5,000 words. And so it just keeps you on track. If you get behind, it's okay. It's not like it's set in stone. But it really keeps the momentum up. It's like, I met my goal this week, I, you know, yay. Or if I'm behind, I need to double it up. And so then you have these smaller goals that build into a whole process. And then in that, you have a date that goes to your editor, and then you plan out what you're doing while it's at the editor. You have your, um, you know, you start a blog tour, and you start uh, making uh, contacts with people that can help you promote it in free sites. You know, so there's all the things that you do. And the times that are kind of a little bit of break from writing the story. So I'm not a super structured person. And so that does not come naturally to me. But Suzanne had me do that with a podcast. And now she sits down with me. She's kind of like my little coach. Okay. She's got the organized brain. Let's put down these dates. I'm like, how long does it take? And now, you know, once you do your second or third book, you kind of have a sense of how long these things yeah. take. The first book, you're like, uh oh, it take, how long does it take you to write a book? no idea yeah. so you know but you get a little bit more experience and then you can kind of pace yourself and make sure that you're including all the little pieces you know maybe the first book you did you didn't realize how long it would take to get the create space formatting right so you really should add two weeks yeah instead of a day i thought i could just upload it and then you then you're behind so mm -hmm. to kind of build in some of those cushions for yourself mm -hmm. and it really helps i mean it keeps you on track and then you know when you're somebody your editor, you know, ends up not being able to do it, then you can readjust and still kind of meet that next deadline. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about promotion. Uh, how how is this different for a book for a book series compared to a standalone book? Well, I think there's two things about that. One is that the first time I had a single book that wasn't a series, mm -hmm. I only had one book to sell. But now I'm juggling, I have a short story in two books. So when you go to promote, there's ways that you can build on this thing. So I've had Blow for Free with the free excerpt about shattering time in the back of the book. So it's like you're pushing people to buy the second book. So I've had Stealing Time, it's been 99 cents. So it's the same thing, like you read the first book and then you're you know, trying to push them towards my second book. And so now I'm coming up with other strategies um, along those lines to kind of get the momentum going towards that second book in the series. And then, you know, at some point you can put your first book perma free and have people, you know, that read that for free. Then of course they're going to want to go into the next one. If you got three books up, you do first book free, second book, 99 cents, third book, you know, full price so that they're building into it. Um, there's a lot of strategies that you can leverage now that you have other books. Plus you've got income on the other ones. Yeah. You can't just have one book, Free. If you only have one book and it's for free, you know, what are you building towards, you know, yeah. it's okay to do that occasionally, but you know, they have a little bit more of a strategy. Mm -hmm. So my other goals are to get it on audiobook and you know, all these yeah, I wanted to ask you about that audiobook because I know it's a, it's a small market, but it's growing. Um, yeah. So it's and just one more product, you know, then you make that one free and they build into this, you know, so it's endless, but you know, in terms of promotions, I think it's shifting a lot. And I don't know if it's just me that I figured something out that I didn't know. Okay. Well, people, people have been telling me for years, email list, email list, email yeah. list. And I always snore. I'm like, eh. Oh. Just the, the thought of having to come up with something to email people has terrified me. But I did it. I took the leap this year, and it has been the biggest marketing ploy I have. So every time I put a newsletter out, you know, I'll have a good reach giveaway or I'll give, you know, when my book was free, mm -hmm. my sales spike, my numbers go way up. Mm -hmm. And so what I've been doing, you know, and I, my other strategy is I have on Twitter, I use Hootsuite and Buffer. Hootsuite schedules your posts. Yeah. So I have once an hour, here's a link to my book, here's a teaser, here's a whatever. Mm -hmm. And then the half hours I do content. I want people to come. Mm -hmm. to my site that are enjoying time travel, historical fiction, mm -hmm. um, you, know, you know, all the things that you want your readers. So articles, 
um, you know, for women because it's romance, for people that are interested in science, for the time trial element. So it's just content that my readers would like. So I use that as one whole strategy. Mm -hmm. And that I have a constant stream coming to me. Mm -hmm. um, and something I, I won a prize in a contest that gave me something called Genius Links. Are you familiar with that? Uh, yeah, I heard about it. Yeah. I'm blown away by this. Now it's $99 a month for a year that I won. So it, it's expensive. But for, for me right now, it's free. I'm, have, I'm setting up a link for each of my books mm -hmm. in these different ways. So right now I have one, like when I did your guest blog, I have a link that says guest blog. Mm -hmm. So I can see how many people have gone to that link. Mm -hmm. And I can see I have one for social media. And so I can measure if I pay an ad for someone, how many yeah. times did people go to that? So I'm really getting a lot of information about what works the most. And of course, my biggest um, number on those links right now is social media. So it may not give me a lot of clicks per tweet, but it is definitely building my base. People are going there, they're going to my blog, they're going to my book links to mm -hmm. buy them. Mm -hmm. So I feel like, you know, that, that's like your step one is to have a solid platform for your social media. So that's Twitter. And Facebook are my two biggest, but I'm on Pinterest and Instagram. I kind of do this matter and things there, but mostly Twitter. I mean, Twitter has, you can have a lot of volume on Twitter and not annoy people. So that's why I have that, you know, that big strategy built in. And I, I use Hootsuite to schedule it once a week. And it gives me, you know, a good base to send it to my podcast, my blog, my books, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then on layer on top of that, then is the newsletter. And uh, one of the things that I've been using is authors cross promotion. Are you familiar with them? Yeah. Uh, oh, with the service. I didn't use it, but um, I'm familiar with, uh, you know, pairing up with authors and, uh, yes. and promoting each other's books. That definitely. Yes. Well, this is authorsxp.com. Mm -hmm. This company helps you build your mailing list. Okay. So I went 20 people on my mailing list. When I first started in November. Now I have 4,000. Now I have oh. almost 5,000. And so what they do is they say you you give away you pay them like depends on the how many people are in the email list but thirty five to forty five dollars you pay them a fee and then they have a free book giveaway in your genre oh great so you're readers that want your genre these are very targeted okay um, and so the first time I did it I got two twenty two hundred names email addresses that wanted to read romantic suspense. So I had to give away three of my eBooks uh -huh. and I paid that fee, but to get this yeah. giant of people who want to read my yeah. genre. It's so working. when I do my newsletter now, that's who it goes out to are these people that are very specifically targeted. It's not just people that read. It's not just people on Twitter. Mm -hmm. A lot of those people don't read. And if they do read, do they like my genre? Who knows? So um, it's, it's been extremely successful. So when I do a promotion, they do like a, you can also promote just your book. So like a $10 promotion with them goes out to uh, their reading list. Oh. And they has cover and links to all your places that your book is and a little blurb. And I, my, my numbers boost every time I do this. So I would tell new authors, if you're not publishing yet, but you're writing, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get your social media platform grown. Every day, go on Twitter, follow 15 people from authors that write like you. So grow your base. Mm -hmm. Same with Facebook. Put posts out. Show them, you know, a couple paragraphs from your book. Show them your writing desk. Show them things that you're working on, even if your book's not coming out. Because what you're doing is you're building fans. Mm -hmm. And when you have something to put out, then they all want to come and see what you've done. You know, they've been part of your journey. So I would say that. And also start building your email list. One thing I wish I'd done, I have people on Twitter like, I love your, you know, the concept of your book sounds great. Tell me when it comes out. I wish I'd gone to them and said, can yeah. I put you on the mailing list? Because you'll forget that person next yeah. year. Yeah. But if you've got them in your little, you know, Excel sheet email mm -hmm. list, they're right there. And those are people that want your book or at least have expressed interest. You know, it's a different thing to make them buy it. But at least you've got a, a way to get to them. In it. So those yeah. would be my two big pieces of advice that I wish I had completely done but I, I did a good job building my social media platform I got that advice early so I have I have a pretty decent platform about 23,000 people on Twitter and almost I've reached my limit on Facebook about 5,000 and but do you get any sales from Twitter? Because I hear I hear many voices saying now Twitter you cannot sell on Twitter it's just for building your network but I don't think it's true 
Mm-hmm. I told you that the genius links that I have, yeah, I, I wasn't sure about that too, because I didn't know if it was just, you know, awareness. Cause they say, if you show your product seven times, then they'll more likely to purchase it. So if they only see it once, so yeah. having it repeat on Twitter is a good thing. My genius links, I looked at it last night and I've only had it for two weeks. I've had, and this is someone clicking on the link to, to Amazon mm-hmm. and I've got it for all the countries. This is what genius links does too, is that it puts them in their country of origins, Amazon site, which is, has tremendously increased my sales in other, other countries. I've had in two weeks, 4,500 clicks on my social media links. That's Twitter, mostly Twitter. And I have a bunch on Facebook. I don't, I don't do as often on Facebook, mm-hmm. but I have that will actually go quick. So yes, I am selling. And before I started the newsletter, and before I started any paid advertising, that's all I was doing is selling mm-hmm. Twitter. Now I'm selling a lot more because I'm doing you yeah. know, Office XP and that email and that kind of thing. Um, but yes, you can sell on Twitter. What you have to have is a broad audience. You have to have a lot of people. And your strategy of finding people on, on Twitter should be to find bloggers, book reviewers, and readers. You don't yeah. want just authors because uh, authors do buy books that's true but you can't just have authors you've got to have a layer of your group so you go to you know one of the the authors that inspired me was diana gavlin so every so often i'll go onto her twitter page mm-hmm. find out who's following her and i'll just follow a whole bunch of people and keep building on that list because those people like time travel historical fiction Mm-hmm. The you know, the things that are part of that book. So those are potential readers of my books. What would you recommend for a book series in terms of book covers? Well, that's a good question. So I've designed my own covers. My, my company is called Blondie's Custom Book Covers. Mm-hmm. And I work with a professional photographer, Jody Smyers, and he is amazing in Photoshop. Um, so I don't know. I just hold mine up. I don't mean to just keep throwing my book up there, but yeah, you can yeah. see with mine that they're, yeah, they're similar. The, the titles are the same. I mean, the not the words, but the font. Yeah. My name is the same. And then they're both the clocks. There's the hurricane you can see, you know, the, but they're different. But when you glance at them, they're similar. Now, my, my short story, Blow, has the same yeah. clock face on it, but it's made out of something besides a uh, clock. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you can tell by the title, Blow, maybe what that might, might be. <laughs> so I think, you know, there's a you have an opportunity to – guide your readers. Like if they look similar, have a similar feel to it, you know, color schemes, um, the font, the, the design, they're the same size titles with the graphics. There's a a couple other elements that make you look a little harder at it. Um, there's, there's some things that you can do to kind of train your reader to see when they see that, they're like, Hey, that reminds me of KJ Waters other book and they're like that's it that's it and then when you have them up on Amazon all three next to each other people go to your Amazon author page they're all there they look really nice together so you want to think about your color schemes for each book do they blend well together you know if you're designing one I'm working on right now for a client and she's got two other books so she's trying to you know keeps looking at the two books trying to pull colors that are similar um, have a similar feel to it. So you, there's a great opportunity to take advantage of that, to have similarities. Um, the other thing I would say about book covers is you, you want to make sure that you look at it as a thumbnail. A lot of people I know do some, some of their own covers or do, do covers to other people, and they have all these details in it. And when you make it really small, like people see when they're buying it electronically, you can't see their name. You can't see the title. Sometimes you have no idea what the picture is because there's so much going on in there. So you want to be able to, whatever design you have, look at it small and make sure that it still conveys those things, especially the title of the book and your name. Um, those are really important. So um, you want to be careful. It's so easy to get caught up in the beautiful art and the, you know, the details that you've picked out but you're losing everything, everything when you go to look at it and you can't even tell what it is. So um, I would say, you know, just keep, keep that in mind as you're designing. It's hard to do that because it's not how you're looking at your cover. You're looking at a computer screen and all that, but when people are buying it, they're on Amazon, they're on Barnes and Noble. And a lot of times it's just a thumbnail that they're scrolling through hundreds of books. You want to catch them. If you got little details, once they pull it up, then they're looking at it even longer. And by then they're like, ah, you need to buy this book and see what this is about. 
So keep it clean too. You don't want to have too much going on. It, it can be very unsettling to have too many things. You don't have to explain the entire story. You need to grab their attention and mm -hmm. make them look on the book and see what it's about. And why should they have a, a print version of uh, the book in the print format, not just any book? Well, if you ever want to do book signings, mm -hmm. you can't just go with an ebook. I mean, you have to have the paperback. And I, I think that's a personal preference. Mm -hmm. You may feel like it's, you know, intimidating or hard to do or whatever, but Amazon has made it really easy and so has CreateSpace to create a book yeah. right after you do your ebook. Yeah. And same with CreateSpace, you can do an ebook from the print. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, I feel like it just broadens. A lot of people want to hold a physical book. Yeah. They still when do. I first yeah, they do. When I first put out Ceiling Time, I didn't have a paperback yet. I waited about five or six months because I don't know what the heck I was doing. I didn't want to have the pressure of trying to do both. So I, I took the time to, you know, go through all those steps and put it up when I was ready, which is another strategy, you know, have have it layered. Then you have the next thing come out. Everyone buys the ebook first. Um, this time I had both ready at the same time because I really wanted people to have both choices. Plus, you've got more things for people to look at. So if you're sending links out for paperbacks or you're sending links out for ebooks, just gives you more, it looks like you're a little more established and that kind of thing. So um, there's advantages, but you know, I get it if you just want to do eBooks, but certainly an option. There's no cost if you go on to create space to make your books. When I order my books and the price has gone down, when I order these, I mean, they're really reasonable. Should yeah. I tell people what they actually cost? I feel like I might put off some people at a painful price, but you know, it's, it's a very reasonable price if you're ordering your own books. Yes. Yes. I know. And if you're, if you're setting it all up, it's free. So I feel like there's low, low income risk to doing that. If you've already done the editing and the cover yeah. and all those things. Now when you're doing a book cover, of course, you have to make, you've got your ebook just the front. When you're doing the book cover, you need to do you the spine. The, the spine there may be a little more, more cost to put your book cover together, but the rest of it, you've already paid for that. Yeah. You know, you may have to buy one more ES, ISBN number for the paperback. So there, there's that expense as well, but it's pretty low risk. So I would say, you know, be brave. Go for it. Yeah, that's true. That's a good. That's a good. That's a good. Uh, good. A perfect thought to end our, our conversation with. Be brave. Go for it. I think it's yes. perfectly, <laughs> and uh, it, it it will inspire authors who are watching this interview to pursue their writing endeavors. Thank you so much for uh, such a great conversation today, Katie. You're welcome.